Chapter Six of the Mikado Jewel by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Six: A Family Legend. Patricia packed her few belongings that same evening, and next day took leave of Ma and the children. Mrs. Sellers wept copiously, for she was sorry to lose the charming girl who made the house so bright also she could not help lamenting that of all the portions offered to her miss carroll had chosen what seemed to the old actress to be the meanest patricia could have married money and good looks and position for all these had been offered to her by various letters since her portrait had appeared in the illustrated papers she could have been engaged at several music halls at a lordly salary getting twice over in one week what she had elected to receive a year but the girl rejecting wealth and publicity had chosen obscurity and comparative poverty no wonder mrs sellers mourned but i wish you well my dear she said when the cab was waiting at the door and patricia was shaking hands and kissing all round i hope you will be very happy though from what i remember of beckley it is one of the dullest places in the world i like dullness said miss carroll who was weary of argument and i am very thankful to get such a situation at such a good salary good-bye dear ma and keep up your spirits when i come to town again i shall see you and write my dear write screamed mrs sellers as the cab rolled away patricia nodded a promise and leaned back on the cushions with a sigh of relief as the vehicle turned the corner of the curved cul-de-sac her last glimpse of the home of art showed her ma surrounded by her children standing at the front door waving farewells and blowing kisses miss carroll sighed they were all good and kind and simple all the same she was glad to have left that dreary house which was connected in her mind with so woeful a tragedy the excitement was now at an end since the verdict of the jury had been given and it was probable that in a few days the whole affair would be forgotten for there seemed to be no chance that interest would be reawakened by the capture of the assassin that evil creature had stolen into the house out of the mist to kill his victim and had then departed again into the darkness and now patricia herself was departing from the scene of the crime and it seemed to her as though this horrible chapter in her life was closed for ever thank god for that said the girl putting her thoughts into speech at paddington station she found squire colpster waiting for her the body of his late housekeeper he informed her had already gone on to devonshire by the early morning train patricia was glad of this as if the corpse had been in the train she was to travel in she would have felt as though she were taking a portion of the disagreeable past with her into what she hoped would prove a very bright future she strove to banish all the unpleasant memories of the past week and presented a very smiling face to mr colpster when he placed her in a first-class compartment with a look of approval he commented on her cheerfulness when the train started i am glad to see that your late troubles will not have a lasting effect on you he said placing a pile of magazines and illustrated papers beside her you look better than when i saw you last it is because i am leaving all this unpleasantness behind replied patricia with a little shiver and i am so thankful that you have taken me away from the home of art i could not have remained there it would have always been haunted to my fancy by the ghost of poor mrs pentreddle yet if you had not offered me a home mr colpster i don't know where i should have gone in self-defence i might have had to accept the offer of that horrid music-hall manager beggars can't be choosers you will never be a beggar again said the choir with a kindly look on his clean-shaven face what would colonel carroll say if i allowed his only child to want patricia bent forward with sudden vivacity did you know my father yes i knew him many years ago and for this reason amongst others did i ask you to be my daughter's companion i wondered why you made such an offer when you knew nothing about me said miss carroll thoughtfully 
oh i know a great deal about you from mrs sellers who is your great admirer said mr colpster easily and then you have the very look of your father at times i am asking you to beckley not so much as a companion to my daughter as that you may become one to myself you must look upon me as a relative my dear girl how good you are cried patricia taking his lean hand and stroking it softly the two had the compartment to themselves so she was able to give vent to her feelings in this way how can i thank you by rousing mara from her dreamy state said he quickly i want to see her more practical and take more interest in life as it is she always seems to be in the clouds has she ever had a companion of her own age no all her young life she had been with older people certainly my nephew theodore has been with her a great deal but like myself he is inclined to study and so is much alone basil who is in the navy is nearly always absent with his ship beckley hall is isolated too added mr colpster thoughtfully so i dare say mara's sadness and dreamy ways are due to her surroundings all the servants are more or less old and we live a very very quiet life patricia nodded and quite comprehended i don't wonder that mara is sad she said bluntly how old is she eighteen and you have kept her more or less surrounded by elderly people all these years cried patricia reproachfully no wonder she is sad as i said before i am glad i am coming to cheer her up has she been to school no she has always been delicate and i did not think it wise that she should leave home until last year she had a governess also elderly yes miss tibbets was nearly fifty replied colpster with a smile oh poor mara but does not your nephew try to brighten her life the squire's face grew dark and his heavy grey eyebrows drew down over his keen eyes she does not like theodore he said at length and he seemed to weigh his words yet he wishes to marry her he loves her so far as a cold-hearted being such as theodore is can love i believe he does love mara but he is much taken up with literary work and studies for hours all alone in his own room basil is quite different being gay and light-hearted does mara love mr basil in a sisterly way she does the two boys and mara have been brought up together although theodore and basil are much older i don't think mara is earthly enough to love any one she always seems to live in a land of dreams and looks more like a shadow than a flesh-and-blood girl patricia nodded absently she felt a strong desire in her heart to see this strange girl with her fancies and unearthly nature surrounded almost constantly by elderly people and secluded in an old country house hidden away in a lonely corner of devonshire it was scarcely to be wondered at that the girl with the weird name should be unlike those of her own age and mara means bitter doesn't it asked miss carroll following her idle thoughts mr colpster bowed his head yes her mother died in childbirth when mara was born and so i gave her the name as the sole child of my house in the direct line she also deserves it for we have fallen on evil days what do you mean asked patricia wondering at the strange subdued excitement of the old man for his face was red his eyes sparkled and his deep voice shook with emotion what i mean will take some time to tell he said after a pause it is because i had to tell you something and to question you that i engaged this compartment we are undisturbed here and we have some hours to ourselves before we arrive at hendle which is the nearest station to beckley he fixed his fiery eyes on her startled face are you prepared to believe a strange story miss carroll yes replied patricia boldly i have experienced such strange things myself lately that i am prepared to believe anything good i shall tax your credulity to the uttermost it is strange as you will admit that the daughter of my old friend should be brought into my life to help the colpster family to regain what has been lost patricia echoed his words in a puzzled manner 
what has been lost the emerald snatched from you in the park is lost is it not the girl started forward in her seat almost too amazed to speak that the squire should refer to the incident on the night of the murder was the very last thing she expected what do you mean she asked again he replied irrelevantly as it seemed let me tell you a story miss carroll i can trace my family back to amyas colpster who lived in the reign of henry the seventh who his father was or where he came from there is nothing to show he was what would be nowadays called an adventurer and in that capacity he went to the new world was the new world discovered then asked patricia wondering what all this was to lead to yes columbus discovered america in henry's reign and indeed the king might have fitted out the expedition had not ferdinand and isabella done so earlier but i do not refer so much to columbus as to those who followed him it was in the early part of henry eighth's reign that cortez conquered mexico and it was about fifteen thirty two that pizarro took possession of peru but what has all this to do with the emerald stolen from me in you shall hear interrupted mr colpster rather impatiently um yes my ancestor went to mexico but had no success there afterwards he went to peru and there accumulated a fortune with which he returned to england he bought beckley and a great deal of land and so built up our family when in peru he saved an inca princess from death and out of gratitude she gave him a large emerald patricia uttered an exclamation yes the same emerald that was stolen from you on the night of the murder it formerly belonged to the temple of the sun at cusco and passed in the way i have related into the possession of amyas colpster being a sacred stone it was reported to have some strange influence which brought luck to its possessor and amyas believed this as while it remained in his possession and in the possession of the son who succeeded him everything went well the family increased in wealth and in favour with the reigning monarch it remained for bevis colpster towards the end of elizabeth's reign to throw away the luck which had been bestowed on his grandfather by the inca princess do you mean that he gave away the emerald yes to gain a knighthood he presented it to the queen from that time the fortunes of our family have decreased gradually and now i have only about fifty acres of land the old hall and one thousand a year well invested that doesn't seem to be absolute pauperism said patricia with a smile it is poverty compared to what our family once possessed said the old squire petulantly once we had wide lands and much money and great influence in worldly affairs all these things bevis culpster threw away for a knighthood which did him no good for a title which did not even descend to his children and our fortunes have dwindled since then until we have only what i mention but unless the emerald is recovered what we now possess will also leave us and our family will die out even as it is he ended bitterly i have no son to succeed me patricia wondered at what she took to be superstition in so clever a man but saw that he could not be argued out of his fancies she therefore pretended to accept his beliefs as true and asked a question what became of the emerald she inquired eagerly for the family legend interested her colpster roused himself and his sunken eyes flashed keenly when will adams went to japan in fifteen ninety seven as a pilot of jacques mahay's fleet the queen gave him the emerald to present to some potentate in the east to the emperor of japan no because the fleet which sailed from amsterdam did not intend to go to japan i was wrong in saying so it was going to the indies akbar was reigning then and the emerald was for him but adams was wrecked on the coast of japan and when he became a favorite with the shogun Leosu, he presented him with the great jewel Iesu gave it to the mikado go yojo and he presented it or one of his successors did to the shinto temple of kitsuki 
there it remained for hundreds of years but how did it come to be in the deal box and what has mrs pentreddle to do with it and why was it snatched from me and mr colpster threw up his slender hand one question at a time please he said with a faint smile i can't exactly say you can form your own conclusions from what i tell you he paused as though collecting his thoughts and patricia did not interrupt him again she also was thinking and recalling that strange jewel which was set in the centre of the regular circle of stiff petals knowing that the chrysanthemum was the royal badge of japan she felt certain that the whole jewel was meant to represent the same it was at this point of her meditations that mr colpster began to speak again as i told you he continued i was anxious that we should recover the emerald so that our family luck should return i therefore read many books of travel and spoke to many japanese about the stone in a strange way which i shall tell you some day i learned that the jewel was at the temple of kitsuki in the province of izumo it was regarded as very sacred and how to regain it again i could not tell he paused once more and then went on quietly as you know i have no son of my name to carry on the line but my only sister whose husband was already dead died also and left me her two sons to look after i brought them up with my daughter basil went into the navy and theodore remained at home to look after the estate then is mr theodore your heir asked patricia swiftly at one time i intended him to be as i desired to marry him to-morrow he could then as i decided take the name of colpster and when i was gone carry on the family in a female line but while the emerald was lost i thought that the luck would not return to the colpsters i therefore told what i have told you to my nephews and said that the one who brought back the mikado jewel as i called it should be my heir what did they say theodore scoffed at the idea and said that he did not want my money he declined to go to japan and run any risk of getting the jewel either by stealing or purchase but surely you did not wish him to steal it oh no said mr colpster so hurriedly that patricia felt sure he had once intended to get the jewel fraudulently if not honestly but i thought that the emerald might be brought back will adams had no right to give it to the shogun as it was intended by queen elizabeth to cement her friendship with akbar we the family i mean would be quite justified in taking it by force but that was not to be thought of i therefore gave basil a sum of money which i obtained by mortgaging all my property and told him when a ship touched at nagasaki to try and buy it i am expecting his ship h m s walrus back in a fortnight but the emerald is in london exactly and it was brought to be given to martha pentreddle that is what puzzles me what do you think miss carroll i hardly know what to think said the girl in a puzzled voice then added after a few moments of thought perhaps it isn't the colster emerald after all yes it is asserted the squire positively when i read your description of the jewel i was certain that it was the same stone it was made into a sacred jewel by the shinto priests of the temple they surrounded it with the petals of a chrysanthemum flower carved out of green jade jade patricia recollected the stiff petals oh is that the kind of stone ah said colpster eagerly and with an air of triumph you see you remember the mikado jewel yes the emerald in the centre is the same which amyas colpster got from the inca princess and which bevis parted with to elizabeth for a knighthood but can you be certain persisted patricia bewildered by the strangeness of what she took to be a coincidence the emerald and the jade chrysanthemum be still at kitsuki in the province of izumo the squire shook his head sadly no basil wrote me some time ago saying that he had gone to kitsuki to make an offer to buy back the emerald but he learned that it had been stolen stolen 
who could have stolen it that is what i wish to find out but it has been stolen and now it appears in london and was placed in your hands only to be taken away again by he paused and looked at the girl i don't know who gave it into my hands or who snatched it she said in a regretful tone you know all that i know didn't martha tell you anything he asked eagerly not a word she said that when i came back with the deal box she would explain you know what happened before i reached home colpster nodded she was murdered who could have murdered her unless unless what asked patricia quickly have you read wilkie collins story of the moonstone yes many years ago well as you know it is about a sacred diamond taken from the eye of an idol and is recovered after various adventures by the priests of the god but what has that to do with one moment miss carroll this emerald also has become a sacred stone it also has been stolen what is more likely but that some shinto priest murdered martha and another priest should snatch it from your hands but why should the emerald come to mrs pentreddle at all that is what i wish to know said the squire feverishly and clenching his hands and that he added bending forward is what you and i must find out we must learn who murdered martha and recover our family luck i don't see how it is to be done sighed patricia it must be done it has to be done and colpster smote his knee hard i'll try said the girl and extended her hand the squire shook it warmly. End of chapter 6after the turmoil of london and the excitements of that last uncomfortable week at the home of art the peace and beauty and rural influences of beckley were extremely pleasant patricia arrived with unsteady nerves and an unhappy feeling of unrest but after seven days in this somnolent corner of devonshire she regained her usual placidity of character although she was irish the girl by reason of her magnificent health escaped to a great extent those up in the air and down in the sea moods which characterized the celt as arthur had been taken to the island valley of avalon there to be healed of his grievous wound so patricia felt that she had been guided to this garden of sleep that her irritated nerves might be soothed and at the end of a week she was more convinced than ever that she had chanced upon a veritable paradise of rest which well deserved the name it is the garden of sleep thought patricia dreamily and here i shall rest until she paused at this point as her future could not be foretold in any way the girl found beckley to be a little fairy bay on the south coast of devonshire shut out from the world by high moorlands over which tourists rarely came where the rolling downs dipped to the sea there was a secluded nook a dimple on the face of natural beauty and here a quaint rambling old house of mellowed grey stone nestled close to a mighty cliff of red sandstone it was a quarter of a mile from the mansion to the yellow sands of the tiny beach and the fertile acres were covered with many trees the wood was partly wild and partly artificial and was threaded by dozens of paths narrow and broad these led unexpectedly to clearings rainbow hued with flowers or to sylvan glades fit for the revels of titania and her elves although it was close upon christmas yet myriad flowers were in bloom and stately palms growing here and there gave a suggestion of tropical vegetation to the miniature forest the climate of this particular beauty spot was truly wonderful with almost constant warmth and sunshine and here again it resembled a villion 
lacking snow and hail and rain and the voice of wild destructive winds the ruddy cliff gathered the heat of many suns and poured it forth when the skies were clouded while the high moors screened this favoured paradise from the cutting north winds it is truly lovely said patricia as she strolled with mara through these gardens of alcinos day after day and found the same bland conditions prevailing i would not have believed that there was such a lovely spot in this cold grey england oh we have bad weather sometimes said mara in her soft low voice the skies grow cloudy and the sea grows very rough it rains too heavily at times but i don't think we have ever had snow or hail the cliff keeps us warm the two girls turned on the edge of the lawn where the woods began and looked upward at the mighty cliff which towered majestically above them like the tower of babel to mara who had dwelt beneath it for so long it looked like a kindly guardian giant who gave shelter and warmth to the favoured acres at its base but patricia thought it looked frowning and menacing it looks as though one day it would fall and crush the house she said with a shiver for the hostility of the great mass of rock seemed certain mara smiled in her slow sad way it has stood there without falling since the world began i suppose she said wisely so i don't see why it should fall now you have come i suppose not yet patricia shivered again it makes me feel uncomfortable do you remember in child roland how the hills like giants at hunting lay watching the game at bay it looks to me like that but mara had not read browning and could not grasp the illusion she gazed at the vast lowering mass with affection for to her it was like a domestic hearth where she could warm herself after a time she turned and stared seaward towards the glistening sapphire waters which flashed in the pale winter sunshine through the woods a broad path was cut from the lawns surrounding the house to the smooth beach where the wavelets broke in gentle play to right and left of the bay were tall cliffs similar to that which guarded the mansion and these ended in bold headlands some distance out on one side and the other rising gently and greenly the vast spaces of the moorlands swept grandly away to the heights above and in their cup was the solitary mansion muffled in its warm woods in spite of the lateness of the season the air was moist and heated as if the red cliff was clasping the home of the colpsters to its gigantic breast but how do you get food here asked patricia suddenly when she saw that mara did not speak are there any villages about two on the moorlands and one on the way to hendle where the railway stops ah yes patricia nodded i remember hendle and how i drove here with the squire down that winding road but it was so dark that i could see nothing on the way and since i have been in this place i have not explored the neighbourhood we can do so whenever you like said mara quietly but it will be best to wait until basil comes home next week he loves this place and knows every inch of the surrounding country doesn't mr dane know it also theodore oh yes in a way but he is like my father and is never so happy as when he is reading and writing he does not go out much and we only see him at luncheon and dinner it is nearly luncheon now patricia caught the girl's slim hand let us go in now she said i am hungry mara but i don't believe you are a fairy like you lives on apricots and dewberries with purple grapes green figs and mulberries who said that asked mara smiling in her dreamy fashion titania said it and shakespeare put the words into her mouth mara i must educate you in english literature you knew nothing of browning when i quoted him lately and now i see that you have not read shakespeare's plays this is dreadful mara shrugged her thin shoulders i don't care for reading patricia it is much nicer to walk about under the open sky i don't wish to become like theodore and father they stay indoors everlastingly do they never go away for a change rarely 
both theodore and father have been in london lately theodore came back first and then father came last week with you are you sorry he brought me asked patricia slipping her arm impulsively round the girl's waist no said mara in so emotional a fashion that patricia felt chilled i like you as you don't worry me miss tibbets always worried me with lessons but you must be educated mara why i don't see the use of learning things patricia looked at her curiously for although she had been studying the girl for several days mara was still an enigma to her mr colpster's only daughter and only child was undersized and slim graceful in figure and movements and clever enough in spite of her dreamy ways to look after herself in a very thorough fashion patricia did not at all agree with mrs sellers use of the word weak as applied to mara for that young lady made shrewd remarks at times which showed a capable character but there was something decidedly elfish about the girl both in looks and ways mara's pale golden locks and pale blue eyes and pale complexion presented her to the onlooker as a somewhat shadowy creature her silent movements and low voice and frequent lack of conversation gave the same impression patricia could not get near the shy soul clothed in this fragile tentless body she seemed to be scarcely human but to be compounded of moonlight and grey mist containing in herself all that was melancholy in nature the warmth and tropical luxuriance of beckley did not suit her personality she should have been placed in some sad antique temple isolated on a lonely plain and under sombre skies the irish girl was warm human life-loving and affectionate so it was difficult to make friends with this undine so chill and distant in her ways and looks patricia began to think that after all the salary she had thought so large was not too much seeing that she had to warm this statue into life but how to set about the task she did not know what do you like doing she asked as they walked towards the house nothing don't you get bored not at all i mara hesitated then turned her pale blue eyes on the flushed and lovely face of her companion i dream she said quietly what do you dream about asked patricia curiously mara passed her pale hand across her pale forehead i can hardly tell you she said in her low voice which suggested softly breathing midnight winds there is something wanting something wanting to bring back that which i dream about but what do you dream about persisted miss carroll more puzzled than ever as she looked at mara's pale pathetic face the something will tell me when it brings it back brings what back that which i dream about and that is i don't know the conversation was turning in a circle and mara was repeating her answers as was patricia her questions some invisible barrier divided the two girls and although patricia wished in order to earn her salary honestly to break it down mara apparently did not neither in look nor gesture did she make any advance so miss carroll could do nothing but sigh over the difficulty of the problem which she had to solve and renew her walk towards the house mara followed in silence not sullen at being questioned and not angry she was simply indifferent the colpster homestead was two-story and rambling confusedly composed of various styles of architecture the oldest portion was tudor and had been built by amyas the founder of the family when he had first set up his tent in this solitary spot later colpsters had added and taken away so that one wing was wanting while the other was of jacobean style on one side also there stood a square georgian block of many rooms comfortable but ugly the effect of this mass of different orders of architecture was to make the entire dwelling look picturesque if not strictly beautiful 
time also had mellowed the whole to lovely restful hues and nature had clothed many eyesores with trailing ivy and virginian creeper indeed so thickly were the walls covered with living vegetation that it looked as though the loosely built untidy dwelling was fastened to the emerald sward of the lawns or as patricia thought halting on the doorstep for a single moment as though the building had sprang therefrom in a single night like a mushroom and the house dwelt in and fondled and loved for many generations had about it a warm homely feeling of intimate humanity but over it as the girl again observed with a shiver ever hung the angry red-faced cliff menacing and sinister the interior of the mansion was as jumbled so to speak as its outside for various additions and alterations and removals had destroyed the original plan of the dwelling if indeed it ever had possessed any such design some rooms had doors leading into others passages twisted and turned in a most bewildering manner and a few ended in blank walls a stranger would find himself stepping down into one room and up into another as the flooring of the whole house was irregular and there were narrow doors and broad doors many of the windows were diamond-paned casements while others presented a large surface of modern glass grates were here and vast open fireplaces there and many rooms were as dark as others were light the house both pleased and irritated as everywhere the visitor came upon unexpected corners or was brought up short before closed entrances it was a nightmare house and like none that patricia used to extreme modernity had ever entered the furniture and furnishing of the many rooms was also fantastic and here patricia saw more plainly the effects of colpster's narrow income as everything was old-fashioned and worn the carpets and hangings the paper covering the walls and the paintings adorning the ceiling were shabby and faded the drawing-room was filled with chippendale tables sheraton chairs vendor stools of the albert period and empire sofas covered with worn brocade while the dining-room had merely a horsehair mahogany suite aggressively slippery the whole house looked shabby and was shabby yet the hand of time had so coordinated the furniture and decorations of various epochs that the effect of the whole was beautiful the sombre family portraits the tarnished silver ornaments the subdued hues of curtains and carpets all gave the dwelling a refined air there was nothing modern or garish or machine-made about the place everything looked mellow suitable old-world and slightly melancholy it was a house to dream in as it was filled with drowsy suggestions a mansion of meditation as the grounds without were the gardens of sleep no wonder mara was given to vague visions a stronger person would have succumbed to the somniferous influence of the place the luncheon-table laid with snow-white linen glittering with diamond-cut glass and heavy old-fashioned silver looked very attractive in the soft light of the large room which stole in through quaint casements patricia anxious to take up her household duties had arranged the decorations of the table and was rapidly getting into the swing of her domestic duties she found the servants dull and out of date but very obedient and although with the privilege of old retainers they grumbled at many of her innovations they did what she asked them to do mr colpster congratulated her on her successful debut on this very occasion you are a born housekeeper miss carroll he said when he took his place at the head of the table looking leaner and more like a student than ever i used to look after my father's house before he died said patricia with a sigh and he was very particular he was even as a boy i remember him at sandhurst were you at sandhurst remarked the girl looking at her host who did not in any way resemble a military man colpster laughed in his silent fashion <laughs> oh yes i had thoughts of winning the v c and so tormented my father to make me a soldier 
but i soon grew tired of the army as i had not the necessary money to keep it up i therefore retired when my father died and have vegetated here ever since i hope you don't find our life here too dull miss carroll and he looked anxiously towards the bright face of the girl i like it replied patricia absently it is such a rest after the rush and worry of london by the way mr colpster i wish you would not call me miss carroll it sounds so stiff patricia then said the squire genially and with a bright look in his usually sad eyes which showed that he was pleased it is a very charming name and suits he made an old-world bow a very charming young lady the girl laughed and coloured and bowed in return then to turn the conversation which was becoming too complimentary she glanced at the vacant place opposite to that of mara's where is mr dane she asked abruptly talk of angels and you hear their wings said the squire for at that moment the door opened to admit the eldest nephew theodore was tall and rather stout with a heavy face by no means attractive his skin was pale and he possessed very bright blue eyes and reddish hair worn as was his uncle's rather long his jaw was of the bulldog order and with this and his bulky figure to say nothing of the piercing look in his eyes he appeared to be rather a formidable personage but he was so good-natured and conversational that patricia liked him and thought which was probably true that his bark was much worse than his bite he dressed much more carefully than did mr colpster and one noticeable point about him were his delicate white hands which he was rather fond of using to emphasize his conversation patricia guessed that the man was proud of those hands as one of his rare good points and liked to draw attention to their perfection i am sorry that i am late miss carroll said theodore sitting down with an alacrity surprising in so heavy a man i was taken up with a new manuscript which i acquired when i was in london what is it about asked patricia politely occult matters you would not understand even if i explained theodore stopped then looked into her face and added yet you are irish what has that got to do with your remark mr dane only this that the celt is usually more in touch with the unseen than is the saxon i come of the latter race and have no psychic powers but i think you have miss carroll what do you mean exactly by psychic powers you can see things and feel things which is more than many people can do by reason of their limitations ah he looked at her sharply as he saw her face change you have felt something or you have seen something well yes answered patricia and regretted the admission at the moment she was thinking of the mikado jewel and her sensations when holding it fearful of being ridiculed she had not said anything even to mr colpster about this and did not wish to speak even to theodore although she guessed from his talk that he was less sceptical about such things than the ordinary man i may tell you about my experience some day she added quickly seeing from his face that he was about to press his questions not now theodore nodded i shall keep you to your promise he said alertly and we might try some experiments mara won't let me experiment with her i don't like your experiments theodore said mara quietly and looking up with a nervous look on her pale face they are dangerous there is always danger my dear girl when one is exploring a new country and the realms of the unseen are new to us your dreams mara flushed never mind about my dreams she said frowning and with a sudden glance at patricia and never mind continuing this unwholesome conversation said mr colpster who had been opening letters it is not good for mara by the way basil is coming home in three days his ship is at falmouth oh i am so glad cried mara delightedly i love basil he is a dear let us hope that miss carroll will love him also said theodore grimly i love everybody who is nice to me said patricia laughing 
although she wondered why mr dane made such a remark oh basil will be nice he's a universal lover scoffed the man shrugging patricia looked at him sharply and noticed the acrid tone it seemed to her that theodore was not fond of his brother i wonder why she asked herself but naturally could obtain no reply to such an intimate question End of chapter seven Chapter Eight of The Mikado Jewel by Fergus Hume. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Eight Theodore. Life went so softly and gently at Beckley that it was like dwelling in an enchanted land, in a fabled heaven of drowsy ease. Patricia compared the place to the island of the lotus eaters, and after the storms of her early experiences, she enjoyed to the full its calm seclusion. Never was there so solitary a place. The Colpsters were a county family of respectable antiquity, and it was to be presumed that in the ordinary course of things they knew many people of their own rank but either their friends and acquaintances lived too far away or were not invited to the house for no stranger ever came near the place not even the inevitable tourist chanced upon this charmed spot beckley might have been situated in the moon for all connection it had with the outside world the dwellers in this quiet haven did not seem to mind being left alone in this odd way the servants, mostly old and staid, were contented with the house and grounds, and occasionally ventured on the quiet waters of the ferry bay in rowing boats. Once a week the elderly butler drove to Hendel and to the adjacent villages to bring back groceries and such things as were needful to support life. The postman came on a bicycle once a day with news from the outside world, and patricia found that the library was well supplied with magazines and newspapers there was no complaint to be made on that score as the inhabitants of beckley always knew what was going on both at home and abroad they might be secluded but they were not ignorant and although not rolling stones they gathered no moss this warm forgotten nook was an ideal home for a student and both theodore and his uncle were students as patricia gradually learned mr colpster was writing a history of his family and had been engaged for many years in doing so from amyas downward the squire traced the history of his forebears showing how they had risen to wealth and rank until the middle part of the elizabeth's reign and how from that period by the selfish conduct of bevis colpster in parting with the emerald his sons and grandsons had lost the greater part of their possessions also he related various romantic stories dealing with the attempts of georgian colpsters to redeem the family fortunes and finally when he reached the conclusion of the book as he told patricia he intended to relate how the emerald had been recovered and how again it had worked its spell of good fortune but if you don't recover the emerald asked miss carroll very sensibly i must recover it said the squire vehemently if i do not the family will die out when the mikado jewel is again in our possession she can inherit the estates on condition that she marries theodore or basil are you speaking of mara questioned patricia noting the vague way in which her companion talked of course of course he answered testily she must marry one of her cousins and her husband can take the family name then the emerald will draw plenty of money to us and we will again buy back our lost lands how can the emerald draw back money asked patricia again thinking as she very often did of her sensations when holding the stone i don't know i can't say i am only using a figure of speech as it were my dear girl but in some way this emerald means good fortune to us as was amply proved by the success of amyas his son and grandson they owned all the land as far as hendel but when the emerald was lost the acres and their villages were lost also 
mr colpster rose and began to walk to and fro excitedly i must find that emerald i must i must how are you going to set about it asked the girl doubtfully i cannot say he resumed his seat at his desk with a heavy sigh there is no clue to follow if we could learn who murdered martha we might discover the assassin and regain the jewel but how can the assassin have it mr colpster assuming that he murdered poor mrs pentreddle in order to steal the emerald you know that it was not in her possession no that is quite true while the assassin was searching the house the emerald was being stolen from you in the park but undoubtedly the emerald was meant to be given to martha since you went to receive it how did she manage to get it i want an answer to that question why not ask it of harry pentreddle suggested patricia quietly colpster raised his head and stared why what could harry possibly know about the matter i am only putting two and two together continued the girl thoughtfully looking out of the window you told me that the emerald was taken to japan and also that harry pentreddle had returned from the far east he what colpster rose excitedly to his feet you think that harry brought it with him that he stole it from the temple of kitsugi why not demanded patricia swiftly japan is in the far east and harry pentreddle came from there also his mother came up to london to meet him and receive the emerald i feel sure of it but harry never came near the house expostulated the squire that was clearly proved at the inquest quite so but do you remember when you told me about the emerald being a sacred stone and how you mentioned wilkie collins novel of the moonstone perhaps some priests were on harry pentreddle's track and so he did not dare to go openly to his mother he must have arranged the signal of the red light in the park so that he could give his mother the emerald secretly she could not keep the appointment by reason of her sprained foot and so sent me i now believe on these assumptions declared patricia firmly that it was harry pentreddle who gave me the deal box colpster grew very excited it sounds a feasible theory he muttered of course martha knew all about my desire to get back the emerald but why should she get her son to steal it i can understand the secrecy of the meeting in the park as undoubtedly the priests of the kitsuki temple would make every effort to regain the stone harry had to give the emerald to his mother secretly and probably for the same reason he is now hiding at amsterdam it all fits in but mr colpster paused and looked straightly at the girl why did martha want the emerald perhaps to give it to you in that case she would have told me of her plans i think not said patricia after a pause she might fancy you would not approve of the jewel being stolen however it is all theory and the only way in which you can get at the truth is by questioning harry pentreddle the question is how to find him murmured the squire musingly if he thinks the priests are after him he will remain in hiding if he has seen the report of his mother's death and of the inquest said patricia coolly he will see that there is no longer any reason for him to dread the priests of kitsuki why not because i believe that harry was followed by one on that night and that the second man who stole the jewel from me was one of the priests if that is so why was martha murdered i can't say of course like the moonstone guardians there may have been three priests one followed harry and one went to the home of art and the third the third may have directed the other two it is all fancy perhaps said patricia hesitating but i think that my theory is correct i am positive that it is said the squire with decision where a man argues to reach a point a woman jumps in the dark intuitively gradually i might have arrived at the same conclusion you suggest by reasoning but i feel certain that you have given me the truth by using that subconscious mind which is more active in woman than man 
yes yes mr colpster opened and shut his hands excitedly you have given me the clue harry was told by his mother to steal the emerald she did not tell me as she knew that i would not approve harry secured the emerald and was followed by those who guarded it being in danger of death he made the secret appointment with his mother which you kept and passed along the jewel the japanese who was following saw that what he wanted had changed hands and leaving harry came after you when you looked at the jewel he snatched it meanwhile in some way these priests knew that the jewel was to go to martha and so one must have gone to get it from her she refused to say anything and was killed by the man who afterwards searched the house for the emerald it is all clear perfectly clear what will you do now asked patricia catching fire from his enthusiasm do almost shouted the old man straightening his bent frame i shall try and find harry pentreddle and see if he will endorse your story my theory corrected the girl quickly well theory if you like but harry must be found no doubt thinking he was in danger of his life he went abroad and is in hiding how can you find him then i shall ask isa lee she lives at hendle and is the girl to whom he is engaged he must have written to her and 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 why not ask mara broke in a quiet voice patricia looked up with a start so unexpected was the observation from behind a screen which was placed in front of the door came theodore dane for so huge a man and in patricia's eyes he looked more gigantic than ever at the moment he moved as quietly as a cat mr colpster seemed rather annoyed by his stealthy entrance i wish you would make more noise he said irritably i thought you did not like noise uncle said theodore calmly and allowed himself to drop into a saddle-backed chair no more i do all the same i don't care about being surprised in this way you should have knocked at the door or have rattled the handle or i did knock i did rattle the handle said dane carelessly and thrust one white hand through his leonine masses of reddish hair but you were so interested in your conversation with miss carroll that you did not hear me and you listened continued the squire irritably i ask pardon for doing so but the conversation was about the mikado jewel which always fascinates me and i could scarcely help overhearing a few words but if the conversation is private he heaved up his big frame as if to go away it is not private snapped colpster sitting down at his desk only your unexpected appearance startled me i would have reported the conversation to you later as i know that you are as anxious as i am to recover the palladium of the family i should certainly like to recover it personally said theodore with point as i know the succession to the estate depends upon its being given to you if i get it i inherit if basil is the lucky finder he obtains all the property you know what you arranged yes and i hold to that arrangement but as neither basil nor you have secured the mikado jewel neither one of us inherits finished dane quietly the one who marries mara gets it said colpster decisively she is my only daughter and must benefit under my will marry her theodore and be my heir mara is a nice girl you can't object mara will she likes basil better than she does me in that case she must marry basil and he can become master here when i pass over said mr colpster with a shrug theodore's white face flushed and his blue eyes glittered even more brightly than usual patricia who was watchful of his every movement for the latent strength of the man impressed her guessed that he was furiously angry but was reigning in his passion with an iron hand if basil inherits he will turn me out of doors he said heavily oh you can make your own arrangements with basil said the squire you and he never get on well together so because i am the ugly duckling 
burst out theodore his eyes flaming like sapphires basil is the popular one he has all the looks and all the he checked himself suddenly and smiled in a wry manner but these family arrangements cannot interest miss carroll let us leave marriages and any arrangement that may come after your death uncle alone for the moment we have to find the emerald in what way asked the squire directly and rather sourly there did not seem to be much love lost between him and his burly nephew we must find out where harry pentreddle is and question him isa lee may know but in order not to lose time i suggest that we question mara no said colpster sharply last time you put her in a trance she was ill for days i won't have her constitution tampered with mara's spirit got beyond my control said theodore quickly and remained away longer than was wise it would not obey the child might have died growled the squire who did not seem surprised at this strange speech of his nephew's leave her alone isa lee will certainly be able to tell us where harry is mara is useless she was not useless when she told you where the emerald was to be found said theodore calmly and lounging in his deep chair mr colpster looked at patricia who was privately amazed at this extraordinary conversation which dealt in a matter-of-fact way with superphysical things and laughed at the expression on her face i promised to explain one day how i came to learn where the emerald was he remarked patricia nodded yes you did mr colpster in the train i remember well then theodore here put mara asleep and told her to look for the jewel she went unerringly to japan and saw that it was in the temple of kitsuki in the province of izumo at the time i did not believe this but it proved to be true and the shrine which held it as basil wrote home to me was precisely described by mara when in her trance but i don't believe in these things burst out patricia staring aghast at what she regarded as gross superstition and the inquisition did not believe that the earth went round the sun said theodore coolly but although they forced galileo to deny that truth the earth continued to circle the sun and took the disbelieving inquisitors along with it do not measure everything by your own brain miss carroll for there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of in your oh i have heard that quotation so often cried patricia impetuously but nothing can be proved not to those who only possess physical brains but those who have eyes can see and those who have ears can hear to those people christ appealed patricia laid her delicate hands on her lap despairingly i don't know what you are talking about she observed with a shrug well never mind theodore hastened to say seeing that she was rather annoyed some day you will understand just now all you need know is that mara told us that the emerald was to be found in the temple of kitsuki in japan that proved to be true although it was learned in what appears to you to be a nonsensical way i believe he fixed her gaze with his keen blue eyes strongly i believe that you are psychic yourself mr colpster jumped up a trifle nervously i won't have it theodore leave patricia alone i am quite sure your experiments with mara have done her a great deal of harm and have made her more dreamy and unpractical than ever i won't have patricia caught in these evil nets there is no evil in searching for the unseen protested theodore warmly in that case if it was regarded as evil i mean men would cease to inquire and there would be no inventions if the searching you mention was regarded as evil said the squire grimly men would certainly search more willingly than if the powers were regarded as good however i put my foot down i am not an unbeliever as you know but i don't think it is right to pry into what god wishes to be concealed thus far shalt thou go and no further that was said of the ocean 
retorted theodore and yet we have reclaimed lands from the sea and prevented the waves from going as far as they used to everything is good if rightly used and i won't hear i won't hear mr colpster walked abruptly to the window you are always arguing leave patricia alone what does miss carroll say herself asked dane turning to the girl i agree with mr colpster she rejoined promptly i don't like such things and think they are evil very good we will talk no more of the matter said theodore quietly only one thing i will ask you since i believe you to be a sensitive have you not experienced strange sensations yourself in connection with the emerald i have replied patricia who was anxious to have her curiosity in this respect gratified and dane certainly seemed a man who could do so on hearing her reply mr colpster turned away from the window and walked back to plant himself before her what do you mean he asked abruptly i mean that while i held the emerald i felt the strangest sensations it was because i felt these that i opened the box theodore leaned forward with his hands on the arms of his chair i knew you were psychic he said triumphantly all irish people are more or less as they come along the chaldean egyptian carthaginian line what do you mean asked patricia completely puzzled oh never mind never mind broke in the squire impatiently theodore can explain himself later meanwhile tell me what sensations you felt patricia stared straight before her striving to recall what she had experienced on that terrible night both when the jewel was in the box and in my hand she said slowly i felt a sensation as though it held some great force which was ever pushing outward pushing outward muttered theodore pinching his nether lip how i can scarcely explain wave after wave of this invisible force seemed to radiate from the petals of the flower what flower asked colpster greatly interested the chrysanthemum blossom which was formed of the carved jade petals with the emerald in its centre the radiating force seemed to push back all darkness and all evil so that i did not feel afraid it seemed as though i were in the middle of a circle of light and thus was safe from any harm theodore muttered again and bent forward eagerly was there any sign carved on the emerald he demanded breathlessly what sign she asked greatly puzzled a triangle a circle a ah oh any sign i did not observe replied patricia simply the jewel was so lovely and my sensations were so strange that i kept staring at it in silence feeling happy and safe when it became cold and dark i then was afraid theodore held up his hand to prevent his uncle from speaking when did the jewel become cold and dark as you phrase it he asked sharply just before the man snatched it the radiance seemed to die away and the power appeared to falter when i felt that i was holding a mere ornament dull and dead and cold the thief snatched it away from me dane rose slowly and nodded towards his uncle it certainly was a priest who stole the jewel he observed probably it is now on its way back to japan you will never get it uncle as now it will be guarded more carefully why do you think the thief is a priest questioned the squire abruptly well you thought so yourself said theodore lightly and it seems natural to suppose that the priests of kitsuki would be more anxious than other people to get back their sacred talisman talisman echoed patricia theodore turned heavily towards her yes he said emphatically the emerald in some way has been impregnated with the radiating power you mention for some purpose which i cannot say perhaps as you suggest to keep off evil and darkness at all events the man who stole it had some way of neutralizing the power which he did when he saw you staring at the jewel 
it might be that he could not take it from you until he had destroyed the barrier of light which you felt but in any case seeing that he was able to take away the force he must have been a priest of the temple who knew all about the mikado jewel you understand no faltered patricia i don't understand at all neither do i growled the squire but i intend to recover the jewel some day and in some way it is mine and i shall regain it theodore shook his head you will never regain it he said firmly it is now on its way back to the shrine whence it was taken by pentreddle End of chapter eight chapter nine of the mikado jewel by fergus hume this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter nine basil the odd conversation with the squire and theodore dane strangely affected patricia and in rather an unhealthy way she was an ordinary common-sense irish girl whose father had been a matter-of-fact military man and in her conventional life there had been no place for the supernatural and when with colonel carroll's death came his daughter's subsequent poverty patricia had been far too much taken up with battling for existence to think of the unseen to be over inquisitive about the next world seemed to her sensible mind unnecessary since there was so much to be done on earth she knew very well that she was sensitive to things which other people did not perceive but she put this down to having highly strung nerves and thought very little about the matter now apparently the time had come for her to consciously use organs hitherto unguessed at patricia could scarcely help feeling that the atmosphere of beckley hall was unusual the isolation the dreamy nature of mara the uncanny conversation of theodore which his uncle appeared to accept as quite ordinary all these things had an effect on her mind she began to be vaguely afraid of the darkness and her sleep was greatly disturbed by vivid dreams in vain she assured herself that all this was owing to her imagination and that she was losing her nerve in a most ridiculous manner for the spell of the place was laid upon her and she felt that she was being caught in those nets of the unseen of which mr colpster had spoken to a healthy-minded girl such as miss carroll undoubtedly was the feeling was highly unpleasant and she resented the influence which seemed bent upon controlling her even against her will yet to this influence which she vaguely felt but could not describe she could not even put a name the only thing she could tell herself was that some powerful influence was setting itself to capture her mind and will and body and soul all that there was of herself that she knew later she became aware that the influence seemed to be centred in theodore for when in his presence she felt more than ever the desire to peer beyond the veil he had always been polite to her since the night she had arrived but had looked upon her she felt certain as merely a pretty commonplace girl content with earthly things and this was surely true or had been until the influence came to draw her away from the concrete to the abstract but since she had confessed to experiencing the weird sensation of the jewel theodore had haunted her steps persistently he talked to her during meals he strolled with her in the gardens he exerted himself to please her in every way and finally asked her to visit his special set of rooms which were at the back of the house with a sense that some danger to the soul lurked within them she at first refused but finally overborne by his insistency she consented to enter along with mara the girl was absent-minded and indifferent still she would form a convenient third and would prevent theodore from performing any of the experiments she hated and as a matter of fact mara mentioned that she objected to these you need not be afraid my dear cousin said dane dryly as he led the way along the corridor 
i only wish to show miss carroll my books and have a chat with her about psychic matters i don't think it's healthy murmured patricia feeling distressed and uneasy i wish you would talk of something else there is nothing else which interests me in the world retorted theodore throwing open a door this is my study miss carroll and through that door is my bedroom so you see i have this part of the house all to myself the room was large and broad with a low ceiling and a wide casement looking towards the east the walls were plastered with some darkly red material smooth and glistening and a frieze of vividly colored egyptian hieroglyphics ran round them directly under the broad expanse of the ceiling which was painted with zodiacal signs the floor was of polished white wood with a square of grimly red carpet in the centre there was scarcely any furniture so that the vast room looked almost empty the casement was draped with purple hangings and before it stood a large mahogany table covered with papers and writing materials there was also a sofa two deep armchairs besides the one placed before the table and one wall halfway up was lined with books a purple curtain also hung before the door which led into the bedroom the apartment looked bare and somewhat bleak and an atmosphere of incense pervaded it generally so that when patricia sat down in one of the armchairs she involuntarily thought of a church yet there seemed to be something evil hanging about the place which was foreign to a place of worship mara felt this even more than did her companion for she walked to the casement and threw it wide open so as to let in the salt breath of the sea it was growing dusk and the room was filled with shadows which added to its eerie appearance and accentuated the eerie feeling of miss carroll yet theodore did not offer to light the lamp which stood on a tall brass pedestal near an alcove masked with purple curtains which was at the end of the room opposite the casement patricia noted that there was no fireplace don't you feel cold here at times she asked more because she wished to break the silence than because she desired to know theodore smiled i am never cold he said smoothly cold and heat and pain and pleasure exist only in thought and i can control my thoughts in every way why did you open the window mara i don't like your stuffy atmosphere said the girl bluntly then her nostrils dilated and she sniffed the air like a wild animal pa what bad things you have in this room theodore what kind of things asked patricia looking round uneasily things that dwell in darkness and dare not face the light chanted mara in soft tones this room reeks with selfishness so does the whole world retorted her cousin with a sneer yes but the effect is not so great as you make it what do you mean you have transferred the selfish energies to a higher and more fluid plane mara theodore came close to the girl and peered curiously into her pale face with vivid curiosity who told you that it came to me you don't know what you are talking about he said roughly perhaps not she replied dreamily but what i mean is plain to you i can see your soul shivering with shame at being forced to obey the animal theodore shrugged his great shoulders and looked at patricia i sometimes think that mara is mad he remarked impolitely do you understand no answered patricia truthfully what does she mean mara slipped off the writing-table whereon she had perched herself and pointed one lean finger at theodore i mean that he is an utterly selfish man who strives to sweep aside all who stand in his path by egotism he isolates himself from the great whole and wishes to dwell apart in self-conscious power she faced dane and in the twilight looked like a wavering shadow there is nothing you would not do to obtain power and for that reason your punishment will be greater than that of others why asked theodore tartly seeing that all desire power you have more light you know others do not mara paused as though she was listening it is a warning she finished solemnly 
a last chance which is given to you who are so strong in evil might but mara i have said all that i am told to say and now i say no more said the pale girl enigmatically and returned to seat herself on the table and gaze into the rapidly gathering night what does it all mean asked patricia under her breath simply that mara doesn't like me said dane coolly but miss carroll noticed that he wiped the perspiration from his high forehead as he spoke her standard is too lofty for us ever to become husband and wife i can see plainly that basil will marry her and inherit the property he looked round the room with a savage expression to lose all this is terrible but your brother will let you stay here said patricia consolingly no he won't basil doesn't care for my occult studies and he doesn't care for me you would never think we were brothers so different he is to me we are cain and abel esau and jacob polynices and Etiocles, and have never been friends since birth i hate him and he hates me oh no no mr dane said patricia quite distressed and shocked you must not talk in that way it is wrong it is human retorted theodore bitterly all his life basil has been the petted darling uncle george always loved him and ignored me basil is good-looking i am not basil is popular i am not basil will marry mara and inherit beckley while i am forced to wander homeless and friendless and if his cousin who had been listening quietly interrupted at this moment i shall not marry basil she said very decidedly we are good friends but nothing more if you don't marry him mara you will lose the property i don't care she answered indifferently i can always live somewhere if you would marry me said theodore eagerly you could go away and live where you liked i only want to inherit beckley oh cried patricia revolted by this selfish sentiment theodore wheeled to face her it is a brutal thing for a man to say to a woman is it not he asked derisively and if mara loved me i would not say what i have said but she hates me as you can see i don't hate you put in mara i am merely indifferent to you besides as you said just now you only want the property yes i do declared dane boldly and i only put into words what others think i wish to have this house all to myself why this house particularly asked patricia after a pause because it is so secluded and so safe for my purpose what is your purpose i wish to continue my occult studies i wish to get others to join me so that we may form a school if i teach what i have learned to others we can create a power which will be able to dominate the world here he grew excited and seemed to swell with arrogance in this hidden spot and by the exercise of certain powers it is possible to sway the minds of men at a distance the wisdom of solomon is no fable miss carroll and for that reason said mara in her cold unemotional voice you will not be permitted to acquire it i know much retorted dane still bulking hugely in the shadows and as time goes on i shall know more the time is very short now whispered mara patricia peering through the soft twilight saw the big man's face suddenly grow white he moved soft-footed as a cat to the girl's side mara he breathed and his voice was sick with terror do you see danger great danger and very near what is it where is it look and see he raised his hands and made a pass before her face mara slipped from between him and the table like an eel i won't submit to your experiments she said angrily father told you that you were not to worry me but the danger faltered theodore who seemed to be quite unnerved i can sense it but i cannot see it said mara wearily and all this talk makes me tired she walked across to the other armchair and sank down into its depths gladly i am glad that basil will soon be here 
when do you expect him asked patricia anxious to turn the conversation which had taken a mystical turn of which she did not approve he may be here at any minute father said that he received a letter by the midday post i like basil i love basil and i am glad he is coming let us ask mr colpster when he will arrive said patricia rising she moved two steps towards the door and before she could reach it theodore had placed himself before her don't go miss carroll he entreated just wait for a few minutes perhaps you don't like the darkness so i shall light the lamp he walked towards the tall brass pedestal you need not be in a hurry patricia said the voice of mara out of the gloom it will be an hour before basil appears patricia sat down again although her instinct told her to fly from this room and the evil influences with which it was impregnated i shall wait for a few minutes she said determined not to be cowardly but do let us talk of more healthy things mr dane the lamp was lighted by this time and its radiance spread gradually through the room as the wick was turned up patricia felt more comfortable in the flood of cheerful light although the shadows still lurked in the corners silent and pale in her deep chair sat mara but her cousin moved about the room actively and brightly with an effort however as it seemed from the glimpse she caught of his eyes these were filled with a vague terror and he frequently moistened his dry lips nevertheless he began to talk lightly and discursively about this that and the other thing evidently anxious to keep his guests he described the neighbourhood to patricia and the people who dwelt therein he advised her to make excursions round about with mara and examine old rocking stones and the remains of british villages and phoenician towers he extolled the healthiness of the place and the beauty of its landscapes and finally promised to take the two girls out in a sailing boat oh we can give you much pleasure here in spite of our isolation miss carroll he declared with laboured gaiety and in spite of this danger which mara says that i stand in who is going to hurt me mara he asked with assumed lightness but real eagerness no one she replied quietly but she drew her hand across her face and said peevishly i wish you wouldn't ask me silly questions you have told me such silly things retorted theodore snappishly you mustn't mind what mara says miss carroll she does nothing but dream we must rouse her out of such dreaming mr dane of course of course she ought to have a season in london that would do her endless good there is too much lotus-eating about this place it suits me but it would not suit all that is why basil entered the navy he loves to travel about the world and only comes to see us once in a blue moon by the way miss carroll you must not take what i said about him too seriously for basil is really a good fellow we have different ideas of life that is all and fire and water won't mix you know in this way he rattled on and then produced a chafing dish of bronze on which a charcoal fire smouldered with thin wisps of smoke curling up i find the atmosphere of this room too chilly miss carroll would you mind my throwing some incense on this fire not at all said patricia innocently but mara moved with uneasiness don't you try any experiments theodore remember what father said my dear child said the man impatiently and planting the smoking dish of charcoal at patricia's elbow when i make my promise i always keep it this is no experiment by the way miss carroll he added while he went to a cupboard and brought back a metal box when your eyes are closed at night do you see colours oh frequently i thought so muttered dane opening the box and pictures sometimes have you ever wished to be in any picture you saw no that is i don't exactly follow you mr dane no matter i quite understand if you did wish to find yourself in the picture he went on with emphasis you would find yourself there i knew you were psychic and all you tell me makes me more certain than ever patricia shuddered don't talk about these uncanny things i don't like them they make me uncomfortable 
theodore laughed in a constrained manner and with a spoon threw some powder on the charcoal at once a thick bluish smoke arose like a column and a strong perfume spread through the chill atmosphere of the room a pleasant scent is it not miss carroll said dane restoring the box to its cupboard and fixing his eyes on the girl's face it is made after a recipe of moses sweet spices stacked and onkia and galvanum these sweet spices with pure frankincense of each shall there be a like weight you will find those words in exodus result of mingling such things a sacred incense as this is smell it breathe it the perfume is beautiful it was assuredly a wonderful smell but too overpoweringly sweet patricia drew in a deep breath through her nostrils and the fragrance seemed to impregnate her whole being she began to feel languid and singularly content and unwilling to move and all the time dane's vividly blue eyes were fixed on her face they seemed to be sapphire flames but as she breathed the perfume and looked into his deep eyes she heard a movement and removed her own eyes with an effort as it appeared to her now confused senses she then saw that mara was on her feet moving towards the door but not as an ordinary human being would walk she rather appeared to be dancing in a rhythmic way swaying from side to side and waving her hands gracefully with clasped hands she seemed to be shaking some invisible instrument theodore put out his hand to stay her but she waved him aside and danced if it could be called dancing through the door as she disappeared patricia tried vainly to rise i must go to her she is ill murmured patricia and then fell back in the chair again enveloped as it seemed to her in a dense cloud of perfume to smoke her eyes closed her breath seemed to leave her and then she appeared to go away to a league-long goal where she went or how she went she could not say her inward perceptions were only conscious of a vividly brilliant atmosphere through which she passed as swiftly as a swallow and far away she heard a thin voice like one speaking through a telephone bidding her search for the danger it was the voice of theodore but as patricia in her dream or trance or whatever was her state of being passed swiftly on soaring to some unknown end she became aware that her flight was being stopped she faltered paused then turned and came swiftly back with the speed of light her senses returned to feel water being poured on her forehead and to feel also the cool night air she was out of doors and in the arms of a man who bathed her face don't move said the man anxiously you have fainted who are you asked patricia gazing upward at the handsome face i am basil said the man and my brother has been trying his devilries on you End of chapter nine chapter ten of the mikado jewel by fergus hume this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Ten, The Newcomer. Patricia was not a particularly imaginative girl, considering that she was of Irish descent and blood. But there was something in the clean-shaven face of the young naval officer which appealed to her. The clasp of his arms thrilled her, and although, on recovering her senses, she extricated herself from them hurriedly yet for days she seemed to feel them round her basil was so strong and kind-hearted and virile that all patricia's femininity went out to him and he became her ideal of what a man should be tall and slim well made and wiry young dane was as handsome and clean-limbed a man as any one could meet in a day's march his hair was brown his skin was tanned by sea and wind and sun and his eyes were hazel in colour he had a firm chin and a well-cut mouth which patricia could well imagine could be set firmly at times and indeed when she opened her eyes to find herself in his arms the mouth was stern enough it was evident that basil did not at all approve of his brother's experiments theodore protested that he had 
intended no experiment i simply burned the incense to dispel the chilly feeling in the atmosphere of the room he declared and the scent was too much for miss carroll if that was all questioned basil dryly why did mara come out to say that you had put miss carroll into a trance oh mara theodore looked disdainful you know what crazy things mara says when she wakes up to ordinary life don't talk like that theodore well then don't quarrel with me the moment you arrive home retorted theodore and patricia drying her wet face with her handkerchief saw the latent animosity between these two ill-matched brothers leap to life to throw oil on the troubled waters of fraternal strife she began to laugh somewhat artificially it is true but still sufficiently natural to show that she was now entirely herself and not hysterical <laughs> it was silly of me to faint she said in a matter-of-fact way don't trouble about me mr dane she spoke to basil i am all right it was my fault not mr theodore's that i lost my senses he was trying no experiments there you see said theodore with a triumphant glance at his brother you shouldn't burn these strong perfumes said basil angrily and walked away without looking at patricia he evidently was annoyed that the girl should champion theodore's doing in this pronounced way one moment miss carroll said theodore when patricia was about to depart also for it was close upon the dinner hour and she had to dress you called my brother mr dane that is wrong i am the eldest and my name is mr dane whereas he is called simply mr basil patricia heard the venomous tone of his voice and saw the angry look he darted at basil as that young gentleman stepped into the house her first inclination was to make an angry retort but when she considered swiftly how wrong it would be to increase the enmity between these brethren she curbed her temper and replied deliberately you must excuse my mistake i shall not make it again when did mr basil arrive he rushed into the room just when you fainted mara told him and he took you up in his arms and carried you out here into the fresh air i did not faint said patricia looking at him searchingly and although i defend you to smooth things over you really did try an experiment on me is that not so you are such a sensible girl that i can admit as much said theodore with an ironical bow yes i did use the perfume to put you into a trance i wished you to to he hesitated to look for the danger which mara said threatened you she finished yes how do you know because when i was miles and miles away bathed in a flood of light i heard your voice very clearly telling me to search theodore gazed at her eagerly so you can bring back consciously what you see on the other plane did you learn what this danger was no some force drew me back basil theodore clenched his hand and his face grew black if he had not interfered you might have found out i doubt it and moreover if i had found out i should not have told you why not he asked astonished because i don't like these experiments but you ought to many people's souls depart and see things and can explain them when in a trance but few like yourself can bring back consciously what they see tell me what you i shall tell you nothing because i have nothing to tell but i ask you to explain one thing to me what is that why did mara dance towards the door i saw her as i became insensible dane looked worried i don't know when she smells that perfume she always acts like that it isn't a dance exactly but it is certainly a measured movement i don't understand mara he confessed candidly she has powers which are not under her own control i can control them but she will not allow me to she is quite right said miss carroll emphatically and never again will i allow you to put me in a trance it is dangerous and with a nod she also went into the house theodore dane with a lowering face and a savage gleam in his blue eyes stood where he was with bowed head considering what the coming of basil had cost him he was greatly attracted to patricia not 
by love for her beauty or sweet nature but because she possessed certain psychic powers which he wished to control she could as he now knew go and return consciously and that capability showed an advanced state of spiritual evolution with such a messenger to send into the unseen since he could not go himself and mara refused to obey him he could accomplish great things had he been left alone with the girl for a certain period he might have managed to sap her will-power and render her his slave but the coming of basil changed all that basil was young and handsome and ardent and with a sailor's keen sense of beauty would be certain to admire and perhaps love patricia if this was so basil certainly would prevent any more experiments being made and theodore's evil heart was filled with black rage at the unexpected thwarting of his aims curse him he muttered alluding to his brother he always crosses my path and puts me wrong and as he spoke he raised his head to survey the goodly heritage which assuredly basil would gain in the end i shall not be driven from here raged theodore furiously i shall marry the girl and gain the property by getting basil out of the way but how is it to be done with safety to myself i must think this meant that theodore intended to draw to him certain evil counsellors who being supernatural could guide him in the selfish way which he wished to take and these powers being evil would be only too glad to minister to his wicked passions since by doing so they secured more control of him and could use him for their own accursed ends to sow discord on the earth plane but theodore not being possessed of psychic powers could not come directly into contact with these beings so malignant and strong he was obliged to find a medium and since morrow would not act in that capacity and since patricia was lost to him or would be through the influence of basil the man's thoughts turned to old brenda lee the grandmother of isa to whom harry pentreddle was engaged she was accredited with being a witch and possessed powers which theodore knew only too well to be real he had made use of her before for there was an evil bond between them and he now intended to make use of her again pending a near visit to her and a consultation of those creatures he intended to summon to his assistance theodore smoothed his face to smiles and went in to dinner it was a very pleasant meal on this especial evening squire colpster appeared to grow young in the cheery atmosphere of basil's strong and virile youth the sailor of twenty-five was so gay and bright and talked in so interesting a manner of what he had seen and where he had been that even the dreamy mara was aroused to unexpected vivacity and theodore with rage in his heart and smiles on his face behaved so amiably and in such a truly brotherly fashion that basil and he were quite hand in glove before the time came to retire to rest the younger brother straight honest natured and kind-hearted did not credit theodore with crooked ways although he knew that his relative was not so straight as he might be but basil calling him internally a crank set down his deviation from the normal to his secluded life and uncanny studies you ought to go about the world more theo he said at dinner it would do you a lot of good perhaps i may travel some day said mr dane in a would-be genial manner just now i have so much interesting work in hand that i don't want to move some of your cloudy schemes they are not so very cloudy although you may think them to be so said the elder brother significantly and there was a look in his blue eyes which made patricia move uneasily the girl's instinct let alone which she had seen when she recovered from her trance showed her clearly how deadly was the enmity between these brothers but it is only just to say that the dividing feeling was rather on the part of theodore than on the part of basil the latter only mistrusted his brother as a slippery and unscrupulous man who was to be avoided but he did not seek to do him any injury on the other hand theodore hated basil with cold calculating malignancy and was on the watch as patricia by her sixth sense perceived 
to hurt him in every possible way but nothing of this was apparent to the eyes of mr colpster as he sat at the head of the table smiling at his newly returned nephew tell me said mr colpster when mara and patricia had retired to the drawing-room and the three men were smoking comfortably over their coffee tell me exactly what happened about the emerald i can tell you nothing more than what i set forth in my letter replied basil his frank face clouding over i went from nagasaki to kitzuki when i arrived in japan and offered to buy the emerald the priest laughed at me for daring to make such an offer and then told me that the emerald had been stolen whom by they could not say and yet added basil reflectively i believe they knew something although they declined to speak indeed because of my offer for the jewel they believed that i had something to do with the theft <laughs> what nonsense said theodore lightly the very fact that you offered to buy the jewel openly showed that you did not take it the priest thought that i did that to throw them off the scent i was waylaid one night and searched it might have gone hard with me as i had a nasty knock on the head but akira came along and saved me akira i should say rather count akira explained the young sailor he is in the japanese diplomatic service so he told me and is of high rank his father was a famous daimyo over thirty years ago when japan was medieval and akira would be a daimyo also if things hadn't changed as it is he is in high favour with the mikado and is very clever he certainly saved my life for my assailants would have killed me had he not come along however you will hear all about it from his own lips the squire sat up alertly is he coming down here with your permission sir i told him i should ask if you would allow him to come if you agree i can write to him he is at the japanese embassy in london and can come at once write to him by all means said mr colpster excitedly he may be able to tell me about the emerald i don't think he knows anything about it save that it was one of the treasures of the kitsugi temple and had been given to the then high priest centuries ago by mikado go yojo akira is too modern to bother about such things but as a loyal japanese he certainly mourned that the emerald should have been lost i wonder if it will ever be found it has been found said theodore quickly and is now on its way to japan basil let the cigarette fall from his well-cut lips what do you say oh that is theodore's idea although i don't entirely agree with it said the squire impatiently it's a long story and has to do with the murder ah poor martha said basil regretfully i am so sorry to hear of her terrible death i was so very fond of her and she of me i read a lot about the tragedy in the newspapers but there is still much that i should like to hear particularly how miss carroll who was one of the witnesses at the inquest comes to be here as mara's companion i met her when i went up to the inquest said colpster quietly and as i had known her father colonel carroll at sandhurst i invited her to come to beckley as housekeeper and mara's companion the poor girl had no money and no friends so my offer was a godsend to her i am glad you made it sir said basil heartily she is one of the very prettiest and most charming girls i have ever seen don't fall in love with her basil said his brother with a disagreeable laugh as uncle here wants you to marry mara and inherit the property oh i don't think mara would marry me said basil lightly and in any case i disbelieve in the marriages of first cousins besides it would be better for you theo to get the property as i am always away the one who marries mara or who recovers the emerald shall have the estate said the squire decidedly you both have known that for a long time but we can talk about it later meantime you asked me about the emerald well it was stolen from patricia on the night martha was murdered the deuce what has miss carroll to do with it basil sat up quickly and his hazel eyes brightened 
theodore observed with a thrill of annoyance that any reference to patricia seemed to stir up his brother and augured ill from the interest displayed by the sailor listen said the squire in a slightly pompous tone and related all that he knew from the time patricia had left mrs pentreddle in the drawing-room of the home of art to the time she had returned without the jewel and found the old woman a corpse basil ceasing to smoke listened in breathless silence and drew a long breath when the interesting story was ended what a perfectly ripping girl he ejaculated talking of patricia the moment mr colpster ceased so brave and cool-headed not very cool-headed seeing she lost the emerald said theodore dryly basil nodded absently it was a pity she took it out of the box of course that talk of a drawing power is nonsense perfect nonsense from your material point of view said the elder brother with a sneer but in my opinion some priest who followed snatched the jewel stole it in fact and now has taken it back to japan basil shook his head i never heard either at kitsuki or kamakura that anyone was suspected and i don't approve of the word stolen if indeed a priest of the kitsuki temple followed the thief and recovered the emerald in the way you state he had a perfect right to do so the emerald is ours said the squire fuming pardon me uncle but you know that i have never agreed with you on that point said basil significantly amyas colpster gave the jewel to queen elizabeth for a knighthood so our family has no right to get the emerald back again unless indeed added the sailor with an afterthought the jewel is freely given and i don't think seeing that the store is set by it at kitsuki that such a gift will be made but who could have stolen the emerald miss carroll suspects harry pentreddle said theodore lighting a cigar ah it might be so i heard that his ship was touching at japan martha wrote to hong kong and told me but why should he steal it and why should he wish to give it secretly to his mother questioned the squire we wish to learn both those things basil my boy ask harry then we don't know where he is he went to amsterdam i fancy when he was last heard of he can't know that his mother has been murdered or he would have certainly returned long ago he should sure to turn up sooner or later said basil easily and rising to his feet poor martha she was a good friend to me where is she buried in the churchyard on the moors beside her husband said colpster also getting on his feet i am sorry myself as martha was such a good housekeeper but patricia is succeeding very well and moreover is more agreeable to look at sneered theodore what beastly things you say observed his brother sharply i haven't seen you for a year theodore but your manners have not improved i paid miss carroll a compliment i think that she can dispense with your compliments retorted the fiery sailor and in any case you spoke slightly of the dead martha was very dear to me and should be to you also when our mother died martha stood in her place remember that if you please boys boys don't quarrel the moment you meet said the squire it's basil's fault it is the fault of your bitter tongue theo said the younger dane trying to curb the anger with which his brother always inspired him however i don't wish any ill feeling let us go to the drawing-room and ask miss carroll to give us some music always miss carroll murmured theodore resentfully and felt that he hated his brother more than ever all the same he threw down his half-smoked cigar and moved with the other two men towards the door the squire placed his hands over the shoulders of his nephews and walked between them proudly there are only three of us to represent the family he said affectionately since mara being a girl doesn't count so much as a man we must stick together and recover the emerald so that our good fortune may return and heaven only knows how badly i need good luck there's that lawsuit over the handel water rights and a bad hay season with a continuous rain not here but miles away and and if your luck depends upon the emerald said theodore crossly it will never return 
it is on its way to japan i tell you well we have one piece of good luck cried basil gaily miss carroll is in the house damn you thought the elder brother amiably i'd like to wring your neck you self-satisfied beast End of chapter ten